This is the convergence forum of the International Intercommunalist Convergence, a federation of various uh, socialist and communist and anarchist even now, um, individuals and groups and movements that are coming together with the common objective of the International Socialist Revolution and inter-support for achieving our goals, our common goals, and uh, giving um, giving um, support uh, in a form of solidarity by uh, explaining the positions of each of our movements to each of our own movements, so that we have a common understanding of each of our purposes, such as the Bundist movement, which I represent as being the Jewish liberation movement in opposition to Zionism, which also claims to be a Jewish liberation movement, but isn't. It's just a bourgeois liberation movement, basically. Oh, wait. There's a, just I'm a, getting a good a very article. important call. So is there if I join again in a little bit? That's, that's it. You know, very good. Okay, no that's the way. To, no problem. Very good. Okay. Now, what we are experiencing right now is the expansion of the... Uh, counter-revolutionary repression exercised by the IDF, which stands for Imperialist Death Force. And that's basically what we're facing now. The Palestinians have entered into an intifada, which is Arabic for a revolution, basically. And they are uh, sustaining their revolutionary upsurge. And they have put the um, Zionist military into a state of stalemate in the Gaza. They cannot win over the Palestinians, and the Palestinians cannot win over the Zionist occupation by themselves. And they are relying upon the solidarity, first of all, by Yemen, which is cutting off you know, the southern Israel port of Eilat, which is shut down, and by the solidarity expressed by Hezbollah, which has put northern Israel into a existential crisis in which 150 you know squatters you know have left people who think that they've owned a house there <laughs> all of a sudden discovering you know that no you know like this is not you know like a place to be and uh some 600,000 have left the Zionist state altogether and probably will not be coming back so this is the state at which we find ourselves at now the revolutionary struggle of the Palestinian people is against the occupation in Gaza. And now the Intifada is spread to the West Bank. Janin, Nablus, Kakilia are all in revolt and all suffering, you know, uh, shahids as well. But this time, it would seem that the resistance is strong enough to prevent the complete suppression of the Intifada. And it is continuing, continuing in an active, you know, military fashion for more than a year now. And in the West Bank, spreading to the West Bank, and now, you know, moving into Lebanon as well. And the solidarity expressed by Hezbollah is not a futile opposition at all, because the Zionist military have not been able to stop them from taking re re retaliatory attacks upon the Zionist state. They've not been able to stop that even with all the deaths, you know, of the, uh, you know, political leadership of the Hezbollah movement. But the military leadership is there. It's on the ground. It's in the field. It's continuing. And when the Zionists, you know, tried to make an incursion into Lebanon this week, they were totally stopped, you know, and eight soldiers were killed, you know, right away in one day, just like that. So that's where we're at right now. Now, I have expressed myself last week, you know, with a certain pessimism, considering that what if... We're facing the same conditions as was faced, you know, by the Spanish Civil War, when the revolutionary forces, which were legitimately elected even, you know, in the in the Republic, are not being supported by their supposed allies, like the Soviet Union, which did not supply them with the necessary means to win the revolution. And at the same time, the Nazis were supplying the fascist forces to suppress the revolutionary forces part of whom were also being suppressed by the Communist Party. So that's not happening, but, you know, and Gaza is also getting support from the outside. So that's unlike the Spanish Civil War, but is it enough 
to stop the complete, you know, destruction of the Palestinian people in Gaza, I was very concerned that it would not be. And I'm still very concerned, you know, that genocide, you know, would be proceeding there, both because of illnesses, pandemics, and because of the lack of water, because of the lack of food, all the crossings are still being closed there. So they're getting like, you know, 60, you know, transports, you know, coming in every day, you know, when they should be getting 600. So starvation is still the issue. So I'm worried that the death toll is going to be increasing, you know, for, you know, so-called, you know, natural causes. And we'll be going into the thousands of the day instead of the hundreds of the day, you know, that were killed by the bombings previously. And to which one may add, you know, they've run out of targets to bomb, you know. So the number of civilians being killed every day, you know, has diminished. But that doesn't mean, you know, that the, that the uh, assault has diminished to any significant degree because all the conditions for mass death are still present and operative. So I'm very, still very pessimistic, you know, as I announce it, you know, it, it makes me feel that way as well. Um, you know, I mean, should I be, or am I stressed out? You know, am I getting too, I know I'm getting too stressed out. I'm getting sick, you know, from being stressed out, but it seems rational to get stressed out. You know, what are you, what am I supposed to do? You know, like, what can you say? Please help me, you know, <laughs> what can I do? Uh, one of the things that, that really helps me and a few of my comrades is I always try to look at everything that I find from the resistance. And as you said, um, the, 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 the Zionist troops, they were um, halted when they entered Lebanon. Um, but also, they're still being fought in, in, in every neighborhood in Gaza. So the, the, all they can do is drop bombs from high above the clouds on um, the people. But as soon as they have ground troops um, invading anywhere, they're met with fierce resistance. Mm. And um, this week, since, since the last time that we talked, um, we have actually seen uh, a whole whole a, a huge number of missiles flying the other side um, the islamic republic of iran has attacked uh, the zionist state with over 200 missiles um, many of them hit uh, hit their targets of course they didn't kill many peoples but most uh, no 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 civilians uh, kill nobody uh, well, well one one uh, 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 unfortunately one person uh, a palestinian was killed oh, by yes. shrapnel and th this may actually have been from one of the few intercepted missiles mm. but um they did hit a lot of military targets and of course um the the, the islamic uh, republic of iran isn't really interested in murdering as many people as possible that the, <laughs> that that is still the exception the idea that you win a war because you murdered as many civilians as possible that mm. the majority of the people and of the, the the nations in the world alhamdulillah still don't think like that mm. so I, I think we have seen a lot coming from the resistance um the hezbollah in in uh, lebanon they have taken a very serious blow um uh much of their leadership has indeed been eliminated because this is now the, the new tactic that um, the Zionist states, that they believe by murdering a few leaders um, that they will uh, 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 somehow decapitate the movement, which is, which is part of a very racist way of thinking because they actually believe that um, all these stupid Arabs, uh, as soon as their charismatic leader is dead, then they will no, no longer know what to do and they will be happy for the Zionists coming. And, and uh, I, I mean, th that's pure stupidity. And th that, that's because they still don't understand that the resistance is fighting for their homes, for, for the place where their ancestors lived and not some kind of mythical ancestors two millennia ago but their own grandparents um, whom they, they they have met and they fight for something that is really dear to their heart that's why mm -hmm. you see that every time the, the the zionist regime has another big massacre the resistance grows so mm -hmm. with every civilian person murdered a few other civilians stop being civilian and become fighters in one of the many resistance forces. It's also a big lie that all this resistance would be Hamas. There, there, there's a whole, um, there's a whole movement with all different factions of the resistance, and they're all very active till today. Mm -hmm. So, um, exactly the opposite is happening in uh, in the Zionist state uh, after the attack of Iran. Um, 
all the planes away from uh, uh, the Zionist state were fully booked. You couldn't you couldn't leave uh, Israel anymore because um, all these people were fleeing. Actually, they were fleeing back to their home countries. Yeah. To be honest, some of these home countries were also stolen 200 years ago from the natives there. So that's another problem. It also, inshallah, has to be uh, uh, solved. But yeah. um, it was very clear for the people who, who just arrived there as the first generation that made Aliyah uh, in their family or, or the second generation, the first to be born there, that they really know that uh, uh, they have another homeland and they want to go there as soon as possible, as soon as it becomes a little bit dangerous. Yeah. So I think that I'm still quite optimistic, but with the same caveat, as I said last time, I'm afraid that the next couple of months will be brutal. And and, and, and probably we haven't seen the worst of the terror that will be unleashed by, by the imperialists, by the Zionist state. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the few missiles um, that were intercepted um, from Iran... There were missiles that costed a few thousand dollars. The interception costed half a million. So this is also something. Every day, every missile that that um, David Sling or uh, the, the Iron Dome or no matter which system um, intercepts is actually uh, bringing the financial ruin of the Zionist states closer, very fast. And of course, okay. they get they get a, they get a lot of money from the other side of the Atlantic, but that the, the heartland of the of today's imperialism has so many proxy wars that they have to finance that they also have a problem, and they also don't they can print dollars, but they cannot do it infinitely. So, mm. yeah. So you know, the United States is gambling everything on the yes. Zionist state. Yes. Okay. And on Ukraine, they're gambling everything. This is, you know, a turning point in history. You know, if they win this, then it's like the Spanish Civil War. If they lose this, then it's the World Revolution. <laughs> you know, like it's this balancing act, you know, that's happening right now. And our efforts, you know, are, are crucial. You know, any little effort, you know, can be the deciding factor in the outcome of this uh, struggle. That's why I'm so concerned, you know, like I know that the military base, uh, Narim, uh, I think it's called, that has the F-35s and a, mm -hmm. a stealth fighter bomber, a bomber there, you know, were hit. Yes. And they were hit strong, you know, by about 15, you know, ballistic missiles. And the stealth bomber, you know, was damaged, I understand. And the, the other, you know, F-35s may have been damaged as well. But that, those are the planes, you know, that were flown, you know, to Beirut to kill Nasrallah and, the, and to, uh, into Gaza to bomb, you know, the tents. Those are the planes there. Those are the planes that need to be taken out. And uh, they were to some extent, you know, so we don't know. But that's an interesting sort of, you know, feature, together with the fact that um, uh, <clears throat> the only civilian killed, you know, is a Palestinian. So uh, it's sort of a, a demonstration of political and military strategy, which coalesce with each other. So the political objective does not contradict the military objective. So this proves that it's not a terrorist attack. It is a political attack uh, as a political necessity of self-defense. Whereas what Israel, you know, the Zionist state is doing, you know, claiming to be acting in self-defense is entirely uh, beyond the pale and it has nothing to do with self-defense and is targeting civilians who have uh, uh, provided no threat, you know, besides their own existence, you know, to the state. And it's the state that is concerned, you know, about its own existence. And it's not concerned about the Israeli population as demonstrated by its lack of concern for, uh, you know, a ceasefire to get the hostages. So that's, you know, one thing. Okay, that's good. You know, the base was hit. A lot of military bases were hit. And it can be done again, and even more so. Hmm? But still, yeah. what I'm looking at, you know, which enables, you know, the, you know, imperialist, you know, death force, you know, to continue, you know, with its activities, and even increase its activities, and even instead of, you know, attacking Iran as well, maybe on the oil facilities of Iran, even though they're being withheld, you know, by the United States from attacking, you know, the radio, radioactive, you know, sites, you know, with nuclear production. So, you know, this can happen as well. And the reason why they can get away with this is because of their base of support in Israel itself, amongst the Israelis. That's what concerns me. You know, we can talk about all the international solidarity, the unpre unprecedented international solidarity for the Palestinian people. But is that the determining factor? So far, no. I don't think it can be. 
because what is lacking is the internal revolt by the Israelis against the regime. And now, because you know they were successful, Netanyahu was successful in assassinating Nasrallah, who was agreeing to a ceasefire in the first place. So his popularity went up, you know, because he was successful. So the Israelis are conditioned to believe that if force is successful, then it is right. That's it. That's all. You know, might is right. Mm -hmm. That's all they're concerned with. So we have to undermine that mentality, which the comrades of the Israeli opposition are, are, are doing. And there's a real opposition now. But the other opposition must come from the internal Jewish political culture, which can affect the Israelis because, you know, every Jewish family has relations, you know, relatives, you know, in uh, amongst the Israelis. And before, you know, all the Jewish families were being told how to think by their Israelis by the Israeli members of the family, told them, you know, that they are living there in risk, you know, and they get to say, you know, like, what is the politics, you know, that should be followed. And all the, you know, in Jewish, you know, families in the diaspora, they said, okay, okay, you know, like, you get to, you get to say, you know, you, you have first say, you know, even though they may not have agreed with it. Now they're saying, no, you don't have first say, because you're crazy, you know, like, you know, this is a lunatic government, you know, it's being called lunatic government by mm -hmm. Gideon Levy, even, and he's mm -hmm. living there, and and he's enduring all the repression that he has to submit to as well. But he's surviving. The Jewish opposition exists. And if they start to win, will the right-wing fascists go and wage a civil war against them and try to carry out, you know, um, a mass, uh, ma um, you know, murder of the, of the, like they're threatening to do, like they've announced to do? Even on talk radio, they announced that they want to go and kill the, the Democrats and the leftists. Is that what they're going to do? Or are they going to get away with that? Or no, you know, because everybody's armed there, you know, even the leftists. So, you know, they couldn't, or could they? You know, it depends. You know, Ben Giver has just armed, you know, a whole National Guard, you know, of thousands, you know, of fascists amongst the uh, squatters in the West Bank. And, you know, who knows elsewhere, you know, just handing out, you know, these automatic, you know, machine guns and shaking their hands, you know, with smiles, big smiles, you know, give them a gun, you know, like, now you can kill somebody, you know, for me. <laughs> so I'm worried. I'm still worried because they still have that base of support there in Israel. And the Israeli, you know, public, which is 55% of the world Jew, Jewish population of the Jewish people, lives outside of Israel. Now, probably mm -hmm. much more, you know, because of the departures, both, both previously and subsequent to October the 7th, which amounts to about a million. So we haven't taken up our responsibility to tell the Jewish people that they cannot follow the Zionists. They haven't done this. All they're doing is they're speaking to the non-Jewish public and saying, look, you know, uh, we're against the occupation, we're against the genocide in Gaza, and you can't call us anti-Semitic because we're Jewish. And that's about as far as they go. Is That's as far as their Jewish consciousness, and their Jewish identity has taken them. They have not said that they are engaged in a Jewish revolution against the Zionist leadership, against the national bourgeoisie of the Jewish people. That's where they have to go. That's the Jewish Bundes position. And that is the position that could win. We could turn around oh. the Jewish people if we had a mass Jewish Bundes movement like we used to have before the Holocaust. That's what was needed. That's what is needed. And that's what saved on, you know, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who escaped into the Soviet Union and were partisans like my mother's brother. And we won. And the partisans were the first to oppose the Nazis. And we won. And now we can win again. And we have to fight. We have to know what we're fighting against. We're fighting against fascism. This time it's Zionist fascism. And we can win. Even, you know, if the odds are staked against us, you know, we've already won the majority of the younger generations of the Jewish Americans who are opposed to Zionism. Even the Jewish Voice of Peace declares itself to be anti-Zionist now. Mm -hmm. It's getting clearer and clearer. And I see more and more articles written about the Jewish Bund as well, about the history you know, from a nostalgic, you know, perspective, saying, oh, you know, like, we have to, you know, learn from the Bund, you know, even though the Bund was defeated, <laughs> you know, and that's the fatal, you know, sort of self-defeating, you know, words that they use. The Bund was not defeated. The Bund won. It's just that it's been censored and repressed by the Zionist leadership that monopolizes the Jewish civil society. And an example of that is my arrest on April the 18th, no, it was two weeks afterwards, you know, April the 18th, um, uh, I, I did the action, you know, like I admit that I wrote mm -hmm. and a free Palestine on a Jewish, um, on a Israel Day Parade 
poster, okay, in an empty space, you know, not defacing, mm -hmm. you know, the other words, you know, just say, uh, you know, like, and using the, the preposition and a, you know, free Palestine, you know. And so the Zionist inside there, you know, like freaked out, called the hate crimes division, you know, of the, of the Montreal uh, Police Department. And they uh, arrested me with conditions and I contested the conditions and uh, the first judge, you know, wouldn't accept a contest uh, against the provision that I couldn't go to the Holocaust Museum. I went and was arrested, put in jail for four days because they're so worried that I can get in there and talk to people because the censorship mm -hmm. is the only thing that stops the Zionists, you know, from losing their control over the Jewish people. All we have to do is get in there and talk to them, mm -hmm. you know, a Jewish person to Jewish person, like I did on the corner of the street outside of the building, you know, for seven months every Sunday. And people change. People really mm -hmm. do change because they haven't heard anything before, you know, that was any different than what they've been told, you know, for all of their lives by the Zionist propagandists. And they know that they lie, but they lie in order to preserve the state because they think that's a higher sort of calling than the truth higher calling than Judaism even because they abandoned Judaism by supporting Zionism isn't that true I think the technical term is a false god ah yes and, and I think Judaism has has a problem with false gods and with serving them it's um... like the golden calf yeah, yeah. exactly yes. but the, the, there is one thing that I've been noticing quite a few times over the last few months um there are several mainstream not very political jewish families all over the diaspora but especially uh in the united states um who now for the first time because all their their children the youngest generation no longer watch the mainstream media but they are on tiktok and um and these families are getting informed by the younger generation and as I said, I, I believe that there is a shift of the non-Zionist, the the the, the apathic uh, uh, groups who who really didn't want to be pro or against, just want to be left alone. They are getting angry as well, and um, every month more of them are taking the step into anti-Zionism and actually anti-Zionist activism. So, mm -hmm. um, and many do this inspired by the Bund. But if there's one thing that that, that socialists, um, all socialists, whether Bundist or not, um, should realize that is just inspiration, just good thoughts, just good. Um, Marx said that uh, the philosophers up to now, they have been interpreting the world, but the point is to change it. So I believe that we, the people who are active, and especially the, the, the people who are active in a Bundist movement, that the first task now is an organizational all these people who are now inspired, this whole new generation who are very interested in the Bund, um, we have to find ways to change this being interested in into being organized in. Mm. And probably there will not be just one big Bund because there is too much diversity, say, within the movement. But we need a kind of a, a, a forum, a, a Bundist forum where all these different groups and individuals where they can find each other, where they can build synergy and mm -hmm. actually rebuild the movement as that mm -hmm. because i think that there are more and more people interested we just mm. haven't found ways to reach them yet mm. yes uh as uh, as we've uh, uh commented to each other there's the uh the bund in germany mm -hmm. and there's also the um jewish socialist group in england yes. who have declared themselves to be bundes as well in 2003 mm -hmm. So, you know, we should have, we can have a federation, you know, between the three active, you know, Jewish Bundes organizations presently. But, you know, it can be so much greater if we also have a federation with the three mass movements in the United States. Jewish Voice for Peace, Not in Our Name, and If Not Now. Mm. And then Bend the Ark is another one, a fourth one. And and, that one I haven't even heard about. Yeah, so... If all of these groups, you know, sort of, you know, woke up to the Bund and wanted, you know, to federate, you know, with the other groups, you know, that are, you know, more deeply rooted in the Bund's, you know, history, and then the younger generations can learn from the three operating existing, you know, Jewish socialist Bunds, then that would be wonderful. That would be, you know, like sort of, you know, really key. Then we could break mm -hmm. through, you know, in the United States, you know, they could walk into the American Jewish Congress and say, we're here and we're going to vote. 
and we have a we and we have lots to say you know mm -hmm. and canada i tried to do that we went you know with the alliance of concerned jewish canadians the chapter of the jewish socialist bund we went to the canadian jewish congress and they wouldn't and, and they were forced you know to register us because we're jewish because the mm -hmm. congress is supposed to be open to all jewish people but they wouldn't register us, register us as delegates with a vote they wouldn't let us vote and then they wouldn't let us talk and then they threatened to you know throw us out you know throw me out because i tried to talk mm -hmm. and he came down with his you know bodyguard his 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 uh, his, uh, his his, uh, his sheriff <laughs> And threatened to throw me out physically if I didn't stop talking, you know, at the American uh, Canadian Jewish Congress. And then they put it forward a motion to dissolve the Congress because they were going to replace it by this organization called the Committee on Israel and Jewish Affairs. Israel first, notice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they did. They shut down the Congress. It hasn't had a plenary since. We could have been debating what anti-Semitism is and how to fight it. We could have been debating, you know, like what our position should be as, as Jewish Canadians with respect to, you know, the Zionist state. No, they don't want to have a Canadian Jewish identity. No, that identity, you know, they want to wipe out. They want everybody to consider themselves as potential Israelis, and that's it. Everybody must be a Zionist, even though they're not living in the Zionist state, which means by Zionist definition that they're not a Zionist. They're non-Zionist by definition. Yeah. Okay, getting myself upset. Angry. It's, uh, so, uh, apparently someday somebody came to ask uh, the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him for advice and he said don't get upset don't get angry he said yes but give me advice don't get upset <laughs> don't get angry so he <laughs> yeah, asked three times he got three times he got the same um the energy of our anger or being upset is an energy that, that we could use but the, the clouds that come with the anger we should get rid of them and, and use that energy and it, uh, yes. um, I do think that there is a potential when I hear what the people of the, the, the these uh, two youngest organizations, uh, if not now, and um, uh, not in our name. Um, but those people, they are close to the Bund, and they're also very new, and they want to learn. I'm. Yeah. I'm I'm a bit afraid that um, our comrades from Jewish Voice for Peace that they don't want to use uh, don't want to lose too many ties with um, possible liberal supporters and that therefore they they will probably never um, organize under a Bundist umbrella. That that's also socialism for many people. Socialism is still a bad word, even though they're um, almost dying under capitalism. Um, they've been brainwashed into believing that socialism means unfreedom. Well, not only that, you know, the Jewish Voice for Peace is funded indirectly by Soros. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Soros is is a capitalist after all. You know, so. yeah, it's um, and and he, he he's a smart capitalist who only invests in uh, organizations that uh, will certainly not uh, destroy capitalism. Yeah, and the Open Open Society Association, which follows uh, Popper's book. Yes. So. I do believe that we can find ways to work together with Jewish uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and and their uh, in the UK they also have like a sister organization um and on many levels um they have exactly the same ideas as the as the Bund yeah. but the, the the very uh, um the most important Bundist conclusion that we will never be able to solve all these problems under the conditions of capitalism that's for them that that's a, a conclusion that they haven't made yet yeah. so when it comes to doikait and to yiddishkeit a jewish voice for peace is is very bundist but socialism yeah. is something that they still have to learn and inshallah yeah. god but guides who crucial. he wants yeah because that's a big difference mm -hmm. between you know the bund and, and the zionist movement you know because the zionist movement is a popular front and make an alliance with the national bourgeoisie in order to achieve you know some form of national independence but the Bund refused a popular front strategy, wanted a united front of the working class. And they were more successful mm -hmm. than the Zionists and more appreciated than the Zionists. And they were 17 out of 20 on the Jewish Municipal Council in Warsaw. And the Zionists were, you know, like 8%. So uh, that logic still applies, 
even if you know uh, you know the Jewish working class and the Bund you know were destroyed by the Nazis, nonetheless there there were the survivors, and nonetheless there's the logic and the program and the history, and all the documentation which we've reprinted in the books, mm -hmm. the Manual of Revolution, books one and book two. You know that that documentation is there, plus the newer updated documentation that our martyrs, you know, in in Phoenix, Arizona, or you know, contributed to. It's all there. Mm. And, you know, we offer it to them, you know, for to discover, but they're afraid still. Okay, fine, give them some time. But, you know, time is, uh, it, you know, the essential factor here. If we don't come with a solution to Zionism in, in time, then the Zionists will destroy the Palestinian people. They're intent upon a genocidal approach, and uh, they want to carry out another Nakba in the West Bank as well. And they've and they're armed now, not just with clubs like before. They're armed, you know, with subatomic machine guns, maybe automatic machine guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the American ones. Yeah. So I understand that you have a text that you prepared, a sermon, which is a word that shocked me at first, you know, because I've only associated with that, you know, with with the Christian churches, but in, in English that would be well, the term. It, I think that uh, the, the the term in English is used mostly um, in Christian, uh, uh, but the sermon is a speech with some religious undertones. And actually, um, uh, in the movement of Muslims for socialism, we call it a socialist khutbah. And a khutbah in Arabic is is a speech with religious undertones. Yeah, and there okay. is a tradition, just like in Judaism, um, a rabbi gives the rasha um, every week uh, on Shabbos, um, in, in Christianity, in most churches, there is a sermon uh, every Sunday. So also in Islam, every Friday, Juma, uh, um, during the, the, the collective prayer on a Friday afternoon, um, an imam gives uh, a sermon. And um, because yesterday was, it's almost a year since the beginning of uh, Operation Tufan al-Aqsa. Um, but also... Yesterday um, was the beginning of Rosh Hashanah of the, the Jewish New Year, yes. and I thought that was that, that was a very symbolic occasion to try and meditate a bit on what's happening. Try to make like uh, uh, um, with um, with your permission, I, I will try to read it as I read it um, uh, during Juma. All praises belong to Allah. We praise him, we seek his help and ask for his forgiveness. We seek his guidance. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our own selves and our own wrongdoings. Whomever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whomever Allah leaves astray, none can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone with no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad wasallam, is his servant and his messenger, whom he has chosen for his wilayah and selected for his message. And he honored him with prophethood as a keeper of his secrets and a mercy to all the worlds. May Allah's blessings be upon Muhammad and his family and upon them be peace. Assalamu alaikum, dear comrades and friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And when we said, enter this city and eat wherever you will from it, from its abundance, and enter the gates, bowing humbly and say, relieve us, we will forgive your sins for you and we will increase for the doers of good. But those who wronged changed the words to a statement other than that which had been said to them. So we sent down to them those who, uh, so we sent down upon those who wronged a punishment from the sky because they were defiantly disobedient. Comrades, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Israelites to enter the city with, humil with humility, sujjadan, bowing low in humility and to humbly ask for relief, for help, and for forgiveness. They were promised forgiveness, they were promised abundance, if only they entered with respect, with humility, and with submission to God's commands. But instead, the verse tells us that they entered with arrogance, changing God's word and acting in defiance. Rather than entering as humble guests, they entered with conquests in their hearts, with pride and with violence. For this, God punished those who corrupted his command. This is a timeless lesson. The command for humility, the rejection of conquest, is as relevant today as it was then. 
we are reminded that when we seek to live in a land to make use of its resources, we must do so with justice and humility, not through violence, oppression or arrogance. In the Jewish tradition, there is a similar warning. In the Talmud, in the, the, the tractate Ketuvut, um, it speaks of the three oaths that the Jewish people were bound to uphold. And one of these oaths, the first, was that the Jewish people should not return to the land of Israel as a wall, which means uh, in a large group, by force, by military power, through conquest. This Talmudic warning, like the Quranic command, speaks to the ethical rejection of imperialism and colonialism. Just as the Israelites were, were told so many centuries ago to enter the land with humility in the Quran, so too were the Jewish people warned not to return to their land as conquerors imposing themselves like a wall in the Talmud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who corrupted his divine message, those who changed the command and, de uh, and defied it with arrogance. Today, no movement exemplifies this corruption better than a modern Zionist movement. For many centuries, Jewish communities lived all over the world, often finding refuge with their Muslim cousins. In lands like Al-Andalus or the Ottoman Empire, Jewish people fleeing persecution in Christian Europe found protection and peace among their Muslim cousins. Our histories are intertwined. We were neighbors, we were cousins, we were allies, and we together resisted the oppression of the European imperialist Christian supremacy together. But today, in the name of Zionism, a false message has been propagated. Zionism is not Judaism. Just as Islam rejects oppression, so, do, so too does the Jewish faith. The Zionist project, built on colonization, apartheid, torture and genocide, has hijacked the identity of Judaism. It claims to represent a Jewish people, but it violates the very ethical teaching of the religion itself. As Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro said, Zionism has hijacked Judaism. It has committed identity theft to mask its mass murder and its crimes. This theft is an offense against both Jewish and Muslim people. It's not anti-Semitism anti to oppose Zionism. In fact, standing against Zionism is standing with the oppressed including many Jewish people who also resist this false ideology. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the blame is only against those who wrong the people and who, and who tyrannize, who, who are tyrants upon the earth without right. Those will have a painful punishment. And whoever is patient and forgives indeed, that is, that is determined. These verses, these ayat clearly tell us that the blame and punishment fall upon those who tyrannize and oppress. This applies to all who engage in, colonial, uh, in colonization and systemic oppression, including the, Zionist including the Zionist project. Zionism today functions as a crown colony of the American empire. It serves as an outpost for, as an outpost for Western imperialism in West Asia. The Zionist entity acts as a military laboratory where technology of torture, murder and destruction are so-called battle-tested on the people of Palestine, on innocent, on, on innocent civilians, before being exported all over the world. This is, this is not just a local issue. It is part of a global system of oppression, where Zionism is the deadly merger between European settler colonialism and a distorted ethno-nationalism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, permission to fight has been given to those who are being fought because they were wronged. And indeed, Allah is competent to give them victory. They are those who have been evicted from their homes without right, only because they said, we have no Lord but Allah. Dear comrades, resistance to Zionist oppression is a just struggle. Allah has given permission to fight against tyranny and the people of Palestine who have been evicted from their homes they deserve our support. Our, our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam, has said, whoever among you sees an evil, let him change it. With his hand, if he's able to, and if he's not able to, then with his tongue, and if he's not able to, then with his heart. But that is the weakest form of faith. Today, the evil of Zionism and imperialism is clear. It is our duty as Muslims and as people of conscience to oppose it with our hands, with our words, or at, the very uh, or at the very least with our hearts. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to stand firmly in justice, to resist tyranny, and to support the oppressed. May he bring peace and justice to Palestine and all the lands suffering under oppression. Amin. Amen. So the second part, because um, a, a Friday sermon is always in two parts, um, also starts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who reminds us in the Quran that for every community we have appointed the way of worship in which they observe. So do not let them dispute which of you concerning, do not let them dispute with you concerning the matter, but invite them to your Lord, for you are on the right guidance. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, he said, for every nation has its festivals. Uh, as a Muslim, we know that every community has its own way of worship, its own way of seeking closeness to God. And today, our Jewish comrades are observing Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. It's a time of renewal, of repentance and reflection. A reminder that all communities in their own way are invited to return to justice and to righteousness. And one of the central rituals of Rosh Hashanah is the blowing of the shofar, a call that is supposed to awaken the people from their slumber. The shofar is a symbol of wakefulness, a reminder that we must wake up from our illusions, from the false consciousness imposed on us by a system of oppression, of colonialism, of capitalism. Just as the shofar calls our Jewish comrades to spiritual renewal, today it also serves as a prophetic call to all of us. It's a call to wake up from our complacency, to recognize the injustices around us, and to rise up in resistance against the Zionist occupation and global imperialism. Rosh Hashanah is also known as a day of judgment, a time when God inscribes the fate of every soul in the book of life or in the book of death. This concept of judgment resonates deeply with the justice that we seek in our world today. For the first time in human history, the entire world is watching a genocide in real time. Every bombing in Gaza, every displaced family, every brutal act of occupation is being broadcast live. But despite this visibility, the powers that be, the imperialist governments, the corporate media, they remain complicit in their silence or worse, in their support of this ongoing genocide. Today we must ask ourselves, what side of history will we stand on? Will we be those who rise up in defense of the oppressed, or will we be those who stay silent and allow the genocide to continue? As people across the world celebrate Rosh Hashanah and reflect on uh, renewal, there's a deep yearning among, uh, among all communities for a new world. We long for the fulfillment of the prophetic vision of a world of peace, of freedom and solidarity, where all the people can live with dignity and justice. But this week we also commemorate the first anniversary of the Tufan al-Aqsa uprising, which began on October the 7th last year. This uprising was the result of 76 years of Nakba, of ongoing ethnic cleansing, violence and colonial oppression against the Palestinian people. The Tufan al-Aqsa uprising represents the collective will of a people who refuse to submit occupation. Just as the world watches the violence being inflicted on Gaza, they are also watching the incredible resistance of the Palestinian people. Some of our Jewish comrades have compared the outbreak in Gaza on October 7th last year with the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. But there is a significant difference. The Warsaw Ghetto uprising was an act of desperation. It did not, because it could not succeed in destroying the Nazi fascist regime. It was a heroic, yet ultimately tragic stand. The Tufan al-Aqsa uprising, however, is born not from desperation, but from hope. It's a movement that has already started a tidal wave of resistance against Zionism and imperialism all over the world. The word Tufan, which means flood or typhoon, and this uprising, uh, this uprising has sparked a flood of resistance, a typhoon of resistance, not just in Palestine, but across the globe. Despite the continuous bombings of the Zionist regime, the resistance in Gaza has persisted for over a year, waging a her heroic guerrilla struggle against the occupation. From the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine to Hamas, from Palestinian Islamic Jihad to the Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, this collective struggle is a testament to the resilience of the whole Palestinian people. 
In the West Bank, the, resi the resistance is also growing, fueled by the same spirit of defiance and hope. Palestinian calls to globalize the Intifada have been answered by our comrades from Hezbollah in Lebanon, from Ansarullah in Yemen, from the resistance brigades in Iraq, and from people all over the world. All over the world, millions of workers, students, parents, children, Jewish people, Muslims, Christians, queer and trans folk have taken to the streets to protest against the occupation and in solidarities with the, the Palestinian cause. Comrades, someone once said that while everything these days is made in China, courage is made in Palestine. And this is true. The courage of the Palestinian people is unmatched. And since the beginning of the Tufan al-Aqsa uprising, they have turned this courage into their most successful export products. Over the last year, we have seen an unprecedented export of the Intifada courage of the Intifada revolution all over the planet. The powers of the old world, the Trumps and the Bidens and the Netanyahu's and the Macrons and the Starmers, all and, and, and their ilk, they're all desperately trying to protect their clone, clone clo colony, their crown colony and clone colony in Palestine. Hmm. But the power of the people, the power of solidarity, of resistance, and the, the power of Intifada has risen to shake off their rule. The word Intifada literally means shaking off, like a dove shakes off its parasites after playing in the dirt. Today, we are called to shake off the parasites of the, the capitalist world, world order and the oppression that has enslaved us for far too long. Comrades, it is possible that this new year, the year 5785 of the Jewish calendar, will finally be the year that we will shake off all the parasites of the capitalist world order. It's possible that this year, we will finally enter the long promised land of milk and honey, a world without classes, a world without states, a world without money, a world without exploitation, without oppression, without war, a world without all this destruction. Comrades, let us turn to Allah in dua, asking for his mercy, guidance and support in his righteous struggle. O oh Allah, send your blessings on the Prophet Muhammad and on the family of Muhammad. O oh Allah, send your blessings on the martyrs and on all their families. Send your blessings on all those who resist tyranny, especially the worldwide resistance against Zionism and imperialism. O oh Allah, bless the Mujahideen in Gaza and in the West Bank. May all their actions be successful. Bless the Mujahideen in Lebanon. Bless the Mujahideen in Yemen and in Iraq for their solidarity with the Palestinian people. O oh Allah, bless the... Bless our courageous Jewish comrades who rise up against Zionism and genocide, even when it means facing backlash, ostracism and isolation from their own communities, families and loved ones. Strengthen their hearts, give them patience and reward, reward them for standing firm in the face of oppression. O oh Allah, bless the millions of people who have taken to the streets in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Bless all those who work to relieve the suffering of the poor and the oppressed. Guide them, protect them for they have chosen the path of justice and peace. O oh Allah, unite all who struggle for liberation, regardless of their faith and background, in the fight against tyranny and for the freedom of Palestine. O oh Allah, bring a speedy and peaceful end to the occupation of Palestine. Bring a speedy and peaceful end to the US-dominated imperialist world order. Bring an end to the capitalist system. Grant us a smooth transition into a just and socialist society. And O oh God, curse the war criminals, who are leading the genocidal war against the people of Palestine and Lebanon. Curse the imperialist governments who support Zionist war crimes. Curse the arms manufacturers who produce weapons that murder innocent Palestinians. Curse the entire bourgeoisie who profits from this colonial imperialist capitalist world, world order. And curse all those in the media who have become accomplices in genocide through their dis distorted reporting and promotion of Zionist lies. Oh God. Inspire those who are still silent today to rise up with us and to speak out against this, Zion, uh, this genocide. Guide those confused by imperialist and Zionist propaganda towards liberation for themselves and for all the people. Allahumma harir Palestine, O oh Allah, free Palestine. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the sea to the river, Palestine will live forever. And there is only one solution, Antifada revolution. Comrades, may the peace and the blessings of the Almighty be with, be with all of us. Let us remain steadfast in our struggle, firm in our resolve, and hopeful in our vision for a new world of justice and peace. Amen. Amen. Okay. I remember... Who made the quote that you referred to that uh when uh at a time you know when everything is made in china 
only courage is left to be made in Palestine. That was made, uh, that was a quotation from the uh, foodie um, who was on uh, on uh, Al Jazeera all the time, going around to, from one mm -hmm. country to another, you know, you know, uh, pre presenting, you know, the uniqueness uh, of the food that was being eaten in that country. And when he, and he went to Palestine and he went to Palestine as a Jewish person, he was Jewish, mm -hmm. but he had a, uh, a tragic relationship in which likely he was rejected for probably anti-Semitic reasons and he committed suicide. We lost him. There wasn't enough support for him because he, what he was doing was making a, a wonderful contribution to internationalism, but he wasn't appreciated enough, you know, uh, although he was very popular, but nonetheless, he should have been, you know, uh, given more support than he had. And so he ended up, you know, feeling so isolated that he killed himself. Tragedy. Yeah. I think that is something that many non-Jewish anti-Zionists don't realize that our Jewish comrades, um, they often have to battle their own families, their own loved ones, their own communities. That, hmm. um, we, we often don't see how, how, how much of a personal cost it is for them to be active. Um, and still so many do it. And still so many have a humanity that is so much stronger than their own individual um, interests. That's, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have, uh, the, the, the time is over that a majority of the Jewish people were pro-Zionist. That, that mm -hmm. If there ever was such a time, it's finished. The, the, the mm -hmm. last year has destroyed this. Yeah. And I believe that we're going to a time that um, in the vanguard of the anti-Zionist movement, our Jewish comrades will take their place of honor that they had a hundred years ago. So, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. We need more support, you know, from the general anti-Zionist movement. The Jewish comrades need the support, need support to know that they can speak out in the name of the Jewish people and not just as individual Jewish Americans, for instance. They have to know mm. that they can speak out as being Jewish and not being accused of, of being soft Zionists or something like that. You know, to be Jewish is not to be Zionist. You know, to make such an accusation is to think like a Zionist <laughs> and yet if pretend you, to be anti-Zionist. You know, if, if you look like 120 years ago, both in the, the, the really religious Jewish world and in the secular Jewish world, um, Zionists were, were like a fringe movement and people were laughing with it. And, and it, it, it was, um, of course, much changed when um, Herzl started uh, contacting the big imperialist uh, 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 warlords in the UK who immediately found it an interesting project. Mm -hmm. But um, they didn't... The few Jewish people in uh, the UK that really supported it were people like the Rothschilds who happened to have had already uh, uh, some colonial investments there and who really liked the idea of having a stronger colony there. So it was the, 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 mm. not just the bourgeoisie, but like the, 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 the top of the top of the Jewish bourgeoisie that, that supported them. Most Jewish politicians really fought against Zionism because they, they, they um, already, in a very prophetic way, they already understood that Zionism will be a problem of the Jewish people or for the Jewish people in the diaspora, because mm. they will be even more than others uh, than, than before. They will be accused of some kind of double loyalty, and mm -hmm. yes, and yeah. I'm very afraid that in a few years' time, if, inshallah, the, the, the Zionist state really collapses and, and the Zionist project is over, that this um, very Western conspirational uh, anti-Semitism will just come back like that. Um, mm. No, it's just been hidden under a very flimsy layer of decorum because um, the, 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 the Western right all want to support our crown colony or clan colony. I'm happy mm. that I made this lapsus. Uh, <laughs> that they, they, they want to support the, this big colony in West Asia. That's why right now that they're a bit more tolerant towards Jewish yeah. people. But as soon as, as, as they no, no longer have this interest, uh, the, the, these colonial interests in common, you will see that um, Christian Europe or post-Christian Europe, which is actually just the same except with uh, uh, secular slogans, um, the, 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 this very 
still very Christian Europe will um, once again treat Jewish people and Muslims on the same ground as the other, as the, 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 the untrustworthy, as the ones we have to fight. So yeah. we will... We, well, we, Trump we will has already started to label the Jewish Americans as being unloyal if they don't support Israel. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Or Thanks if they don't support him. Yeah. Did, did, did you hear his speech for the APAC where he said that if I lose the election, well, I won't say anything, but I think it's the fault of the Jews. And I mean, that, that, that that's Man. so one of, I, I think without any doubt, the president in US, uh, in, in, in US history who did um, the most to favor the Zionist project, um, not because he was so more Zionist, but I think it was mostly because of his son-in-law, who was just one of the best friends of Netanyahu. Um, but um, this arch-Zionist president is also one of the most openly anti-Semitic ones. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's um, okay. It's so that'll drive you know Jewish people against uh, against Zionism. They'll realize you know that they've that Zionism is collaborating and supporting and building up their enemies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like the Zionists, I'm reading the book by Tony Greenstein now about the history of the Zionist collaboration with the Nazis during the Holocaust. It's incredible, you know, of the Judenrat, that is the Jewish councils that were set up by the Nazis in each of the ghettos mm -hmm. to make up a list of the Jewish people to be sent off, you know, to the death camps, which they knew about, but they didn't tell the Jewish people about. And they sent them off and even helped to collect the Jewish people to go to the trains. Mm -hmm. Two accounts I've read of this Judenrat. And one, it says that 70.1% of them were Zionists of one tendency or another. And the book by Tony Greenstein confirms and says that it's 67.1%. So these were the Zionists who were working to send the Jewish people off to the death camps. And why? Could they do that, you know, without sort of, you know, being worried about losing their potential supporters is because they knew that the Jewish working class and the Jewish Bundes were lost to them forever. And all they could sort of hope for was that they would disappear. And so they didn't care if the Nazis killed off the Jewish proletariat. They mm -hmm. couldn't care less because they weren't supporters of Zionism. And that's all they cared, mm -hmm. the Zionists cared about. And Ben-Gurion said so himself explicitly, you know, that he didn't care about, you know, saving, you know, Jewish children being sent to England. No, they had to, uh, you know, go to Palestine or, or nowhere. And uh, no, uh, Ben Gurion literally said, if I could save all the Jewish people by sending them to the UK, or just half the Jewish people by send bringing them to to Palestine, I would bring them to Palestine. So hmm. I don't mind killing half of the Jewish people if I could have my my my, my colonial pet project. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's this really shows because at that time um, the, the Zionist movement, especially during the, the the Second World War and 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 the Shoah and the Holocaust, the the, the Zionist movement didn't realize what great propagandist value they could get out of that. Yeah, because the first years after the the the, the, the Holocaust, when refugees um, from the camps came to Palestine and and later to 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 to, to occupy Palestine to this Zionist state. They were treated as, oh, you survived the camps, so you must be a coward. They they, they were treated as as weak, as cowards, and and yeah. and actually undesired, which is a term, by the way, that was used a few years before by another regime. But mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 whole idea um, of Zionism was that uh, in the Jewish soil, because it's a blood and soil um, ideology, and in the Jewish soil, which means Palestine, um, the shit, the, the 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 Jew, the diaspora Jew will disappear, mm -hmm. and the new Hebrew person, which actually just looks like a very blonde, blue-eyed Aryan uh, uh, um, Nazi propagandist, but he will emerge as a, the actual essence of uh, 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 what Judaism is. So that it wasn't just a very racist and, and and blood and soil it was actually a very germanic idea because the jewish people in palestine were supposed to become somehow blonde blue-eyed uh, uh, yeah. uh germanic giants yeah yeah well you know net uh, wife you know uh you know uh um colored her hair blonde of course you know to fit into the stereotype mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it fits um but uh yeah, and, and and you 
everybody knows what they have done to the Jewish people who came from the Arab countries and who looked, let's say, mm. a bit too Palestinian. It was quite mm. clear that, the, that there was a hierarchy of Jewish people within the Zionist state mm -hmm. and a very white Ashkenazim were uh, at the top. Then the Sephradim were somewhere in between, but it was quite clear that the Mizrahim, they were, they were half Arabs and they, they, they yeah. spoke like... Um, Yes, I mentioned that. They were only dinner. needed as a new proletariat because they were they, they didn't want yeah. the real Arabs as a proletariat. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that in a, an interview with the uh, a Zionist radio station CJAD here in Montreal one time during the uh, second protest against uh, genocide in Gaza here in Montreal. And I said that there was uh, the Zionist state, you know, represented two apartheids, one against the Palestinians and the other against the Mizrahim. And the interviewer said, what was shocked you know truly shocked so he gave me the opportunity to repeat it and so i repeated it you know that there was two apartheids not just one but two mm -hmm. and the two the second one against jewish people you know so it was not a question of anti-semitism you know to make the accusation you know because it was also jewish people who were being treated to the same methodology mm -hmm. of you know national chauvinism of the ashkenazim leaders you know so the uh, but um, this uh, is uh, so big a problem, and we have so few resources left. You know, after the Holocaust, we were so destroyed by the Nazis, even though we survived, and it's so difficult to rebuild because the assimilationist, you know, tendency of the Jewish American mentality seemed to be so successful. You know that. You know, even one Jewish activist, you know, in New York told me that there was no anti-Semitism in the United States of America. I said, what? <laughs> you, know, like, you know, just because, you know, in his block in New York, you know, there was no anti-Semitism, you know, that meant that all of the United States, you know, was was cured, you know, and assimilation, you know, was was the logical approach to take, you know, to argue, you know, against the Zionists, you know, that they can just assimilate. Well, the Zionists know that assimilation doesn't work. It didn't work in Germany. Great assimilationist tendency of the German uh, Jewish population, and so many were intermarried, and 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 yet you know still there was this general purge in Spain. Fourteen ninety two assimilation didn't work even for those who converted you know to Christianity Catholicism. No, they weren't accepted. Same thing in Germany. You know, that, the... that, that was actually Spain after the, the they call it the Reconquista, but the Catholics had never so the Conquista of of Al Andalus. Um, the Jewish and Muslim people who converted were not trusted, and that's yeah, that's actually when the, the the Spanish Catholics invented the Jewish race, because mm. they said that being Jewish was not really a religion; it's something in your blood. So you could be a pure blood Christian or an unpure blood Christian, which means that one of your ancestors was uh, was either Jewish or Muslim, and so yes. the whole idea that the Jewish people are a race was not invented in 19th century Germany, but was invented by the um, by the Catholics in Spain. Catholic Church. During I what I, I would call the, the previous uh, Holocaust, because that was just another... Mm. Uh, thousands of Jewish people were murdered. There was an ethnic cleansing of the whole land. Um, yeah, yeah. The Zionists did not invent it. The Jewish people had been a victim of this for centuries. And yeah. So when the Zionists argue against simple assimilationism, as a solution to, quote-unquote, the Jewish question, well, their argument, you know, uh, is it resounds well amongst the Jewish people because they know the assimilation doesn't work, even though they're still attempting to do so, to assimilate. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, integration is another matter. You know, integration as a Jewish person into the given society in which you're living, you know, should be possible and is desirable, just as it mm -hmm. is, you know, for the Black nation in the United States. But it's not sufficient. Okay, and national cultural autonomy is appropriate, but they don't consider that. You know, they say only in a Jewish state can Jewish people, you know, have security. But it's not true. It's not true because there's war, because, they've, you know, a state, you know, in and of itself, you know, uh, destroys uh, anybody who doesn't conform to the national identity of that state. And so it will be in war, in perpetual war. So, but... You know, what, what it is, you know, about Europe and Germany in particular is that they think that by supporting Israel that they are, oh, Andrew's coming in. You know, Hello. Uh, 
Hello, peace and blessing. Oh, Kara, Comrade Storm. Hello. So we, we've had a discussion Another... about Zionism here, and I was just about to say that the reason why Europe and Germany are so supportive of, is, of Israel is because they think that that's their way of making amends for the Holocaust. <laughs> well, it's not. You know, it's not you I mean, know, good enough. Well, well, and, and they're making, you know, the Palestinians pay for their own, you know, insanity. So if they want to make well, amends, you know, well, to the Jewish people, you know, like set aside, you know, a territory in Germany to be a Jewish autonomous territory. That's it. That's for all. The, for, the, for the populations, I would agree. For the governments, I don't. I actually mm -hmm. feel that it is for like primarily anti-Semitic purposes that the upper class is like enthralled in this stuff. You know, like um, oh, you because they want the like Jewish Christians. people to leave to go to Palestine. Well, and, and, it and, depends and on like Jewish reasons. different types because there's different ways of going about it. You have the ones who want to use the Jewish people as imperialists. You have the ones who want. Um, I can't. Sorry, I'm not a sir either. I'm not a sir. But um, yes. what's it? Uh, so when we're looking at like the bourgeois these relationship in this, we've got to look at like what dominates the the Anglo sphere which created Israel, and that is um Presbyterianism. And <laughs> Presbyterianism has the belief that um, they believe in the rapture. Presbyterianism, um, you know, uh, Anglican Christianity, as people more know it by, um, has had a history of being raunchantly involved in evangelicalism from its start. You know, while like a lot of sects of Christianity, you can talk about, you know, evangelicalism being like a a, a modifier on it, like uh, like Catholicism. Um, Anglicanism was kind of designed to be like that out the out the pit, you know, like. Um, it was designed to make a new pope out of the out of the English monarch. Yeah. yeah. And so when they, they, their perspective on it is that you need to send the Jewish people there because the, it's like a part of like the like the the, the necessary sacrifice for the the rapture, you know, uh, because basically they believe that the the war to end all wars, the 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 ending event, uh, the rapture is going to begin in um in Palestine. And so they believe that by sending all the Jewish people there to go basically die in the first battlefield of the war with the Antichrist. It sounds so fucking crazy. Like, I'm, I'm not stoned enough for this, right? Like, I haven't spoken to Joyce in hours. It, 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 is, it but... is scientific. I, I, I've seen the calculations. It will happen in 1884, uh, 1844. <laughs> oh, so, no, oh. in 2012. Um, oh. For sure, 2012. That's <laughs> no, no, I mean... no, 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 no. 2026, 2026. New update. <laughs> I just, okay. I just, uh, I checked my secret. Oh no, no, no! It's happening right flag. now. It's happening right now. Right now, it's <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, it, it was supposed to happen in 2012, but the problem was that um, the end of the world still had problems with the millennium bug that it didn't come oh, over. Yes. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why there's. <laughs> yeah, well, it should have run on Linux. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I would like to say, um, when Germany says that their Staatsraison uh, to to help the Zionist state is, is has something to do with their uh, uh, Nazi past, that's bullshit. That's propaganda. Um, mm -hmm. At first, the Zionist state was supported by the British Empire, who actually were a bit tired of it by the end of the 40s because they had suffered too many military losses from the Arabs themselves. So the next... Um, the next bunch of imperialists were the French and the Germans. They were the ones arming Israel uh, uh, massively. They were the ones uh, actually investing in it. And it was the, the German, um, West German bourgeoisie, because at that time, if you remember, Germany was split uh, into um, a part in the East that um, very much denazified and then a part in the West, let's say that denazified a bit less um, and they were the ones who really wanted their um, colonial interests uh, safeguarded by the Zionist state 
And actually, the United States only came really into the pictures with the, uh, with the 1967 war. That was a time when the United States really decided, okay, um, the Zionist state might become our um, crown colony in uh, uh, West Asia. But yeah. the idea that, that the European bourgeoisie does this because um, uh, uh, they regret what happened during the Nazi, that, that's bullshit. They don't regret anything. If, they, if the German state would have regretted anything about the Nazism, they wouldn't have left the Nazi judges in uh, in charge they wouldn't have let or uh, i mean most of the nazi cater except for maybe the top layer was which is still in charge 10 20 years later so yeah, germany is the leader of europe right now germany is well. like yeah. yeah germany is the leading economy in the european union they control mm -hmm. the european courts because of it because the european courts the european system is all controlled by mm -hmm. the banking system finance mm -hmm. capital and yeah. um What's it? I and would also, say uh, two things. Kurt Waldheim controlled the United Nations as well, a former mm -hmm. Nazi. I would, yes. I would say um, two things to what you said, Red Wasp. Uh, with the British, they kind of technically never really supported it. They kind of just enabled it. Like, they bowed hard support so that they could, like, uh, take advantage of that, like, colonial interest to kick Jews out of uh, Europe. But then also... Um, so they could just throw them under the bus and throw the Palestinians under the bus and try and make a rigid, like, direct colony. And it was actually Palestinians that were protecting a lot of those early, like, uh, you know, late tens, early twenties Jewish, uh, like, settlers from the British who were targeting them. Um, the British collaborated and went against, they fought with, it was kind of an on and off weird relationship with them and the Zionists, but they never really got along with their paramilitary orgs because it was seen as a threat. Um, America, you are correct, that is like a big player in it. America didn't come in the scene until the 60s. But America actually exploited this contradiction in the Zionists with the British um, and armed the Zionist paramilitary organizations in the 40s. And uh, that's when you got the bombing of the King George's Hotel and the, the, the eventually the Nakba, which is, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's framed. That's where you get that framing. You know, Israel constantly frames it as this like, Oh, we're um, you know, uh, we 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 uh, we fought against the British. We liberated ourselves from the British, and it's like, mm. okay, the British were oppressing the area, and you did fight against mm. them. However, the Arabs were the ones who started the liberation struggle against the British, and you know who the Zionists were not on the side of. Goddamn the Arabs, mm. and like, and it's just like you know, um, they they. I mean, in the spirit of things, you know, bombing Jerusalem is like, it, it, it is the, the, the shit that sparked off that struggle. Mm -hmm. And it is the shit we're seeing now to this day with the way Gaza is being, like, blown up to shit. You know, these people will, like, you know, um, desecrate the fucking, the, the, the uh, you know, the, um, you know, Hebrew heritage by, like, acclaimating that they care so much for this land and that they need to have it, that they will decimate, you know, um, buildings to rubble that have existed for 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years. We don't mm -hmm. have fucking writing that goes that far back. You know, like, we have, like, symbols at best. And, like, you know, when it comes to that kind of history, you're going, like, way out of our sort of scope of things. But those buildings... They speak volumes of the past. We don't know exactly who built them, who put them there, but you can evaluate a lot based on architecture. You blow that architecture away and you lose the last scent that you've got to define a culture like, of, of, of history. Like, you know, and, uh, you know, they go on about all this. They go on about how they're like rebellious against the British. They are the British. They are the <laughs> British. They're like the Irish that went to America. They are the yeah. British. You know, once you start <laughs> acting like a Brit and you start colonizing and oppressing other people, you might as well be British, you know? So mm. Israel trying to claim that it, it rebelled against the British to get itself its freedom when Britain is one of its, like, biggest co-sponsors and has been for a long time. They just, you know, they were a bit salty after, like, the whole world basically ganged up on them to form Israel in the 40s. And then the whole world ganged up on Britain again in the, with the Suez crisis. So Britain, <laughs> Britain's been a bit salty about some stuff, but... See, if Israel's so rebellious against the British, it's like the Americans. Yes, the Americans, like, you're so rebellious against the British. Well, why did you get along so well then? 
<laughs> like, what's oh. this what's this little relationship we see going on here? Like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should introduce everybody, which I haven't done so. You know, this is uh, Comrade Storm, Kara. Hi. The, I'm uh, late because I'm at the A and E. Yes. And you're also in the uh, not so great Britain, and so that you're talking about, you know, England, you know, from a internal perspective. From you know what you're talking about there, okay? And I uh, uh, in uh, Belgium, I would like, to... yes, has this uh, to say. Go ahead. I, I would like to be, because um, uh, what Comrade Storm said about um, destroying the whole past of uh, actually bombing to shreds the whole past of Palestine and um, the whole idea that Zionism is against assimilationism actually they made a European like model state they 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 they, they uh, or imitation of a European state um, Zionism is is one of the most assimilationist uh, uh, ideologies, ideologies that I've ever known in Judaism. Yeah. Um, but they have the idea that yes, we have to assimilate, but not into the European society. We have to get out of it and build Europe um, in our land. And yes. uh, what, 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 uh, um, a rabbi once uh, told told a very nice joke. You know what's the, the big difference between Herzl and Jesus? Uh, Jesus that's celebrated Hanukkah and Herzl ce celebrated Christmas. That that's that's the whole idea of. Uh, um... True. Yeah, the Zionists are yeah. Jewish yeah. Protestants. Oh, you know, that's that it. One. That's all. Yes. Yeah. I am stealing that one. That is so good. But it it, it it shows because it is actually true. Well, it, it's not really we, we don't really know too much about how uh, Hanukkah was celebrated two thousand years ago. So the Jesus part. Peace be upon him. I think that might be true. But Herzl did have a, a Christmas tree and it did think that the best way for Jewish <laughs> people um and that, that that was like the, the old uh Moses Mendelssohn on steroids, the the the, the old um uh, uh the 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 Haskala, the the Maskilim, the, the the enlightened Judaism of one century before that was um yeah we have to be the most enlightened Jewish people and this means becoming German Protestant Christians and take over all <laughs> their ideas um, so oh, the it, it was really it, it, if you look at the beginning of the, the um. 19th century, the big debates um, between the, the, the two major groups then. You had the Hasidim, the, 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 the Hasidic, a, a new, um, a very charismatic, actually very proletarian movement. And then you, you, you had the Mitnagdim, the, 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 the Jewish establishment that already existed before that. And they had many differences about um, how should uh, animals be slaughtered to be kosher. Well, uh, Moses Mendelssohn said, we should eat pork. And then there were all like uh, a lot of discussions about details, what you can and cannot do on Shabbos. Moses Mendelssohn said, no, we should celebrate Sunday like the Christians. And mm. Herzl actually went uh, into all of that until somebody told him, no, 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 no. You should uh, do everything far more Jewish and make it a Jewish national. And, and then they started um, uh, uh, taking all these symbols from the Jewish religion, but actually... Um, the, the, the first generation of political Zionists, they hated Judaism, they hated the Jewish religion, they hated everything that had to do with it. They wanted, uh, uh, yeah, they didn't want anything. There. All they liked mm -hmm. about the Jewish religion was that God had promised them the land. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. isn't even that's true. Still, that's still a feature oh. we see with Zionism, you know, like, uh, um, you know, it's like uh, their, their performative Judaism. You know, like yes. you'll see them like um, putting up. Now, I'm not Hebrew, I can't say this, but I've had Hebrew comrades point out that they come up with Hebrew names that don't actually work in Hebrew because they're just trying to, like, fucking Torah, Torah being fucking, like, Jewish while being Jewish. And it is, like, absolutely wild. Like, uh, you'll, you can find, like, Americans that call themselves Judeo-Christians that probably commit more to Judaism than Zionists do. But the, uh, what's it? Um... It is all about that land. It's all about that being given land. And with the like a replacement of symbols, like it's that like gaslighting process, you know, like people didn't latch straight to Zionism. It took it, what, like 60 years to really like kick off to a point like I actually had a movement, you know, the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So like um, Zionism, like uh, it, it built up over time because it managed to eventually weasel their way and refine its gaslighting. But, you know, this isn't what Zionists do, but just think of this as a sort of, like, extreme example of the paradigm. You know, if you go around someone's home and, like, 
Maybe you don't know the Jewish. Maybe you know the Jewish. You see a Christmas tree, you might be a bit sus, but that's fine. Anyone can celebrate Christmas. If you see mm -hmm. a star of David on top of a Christmas tree, something's going wrong there. I mean, David already being flaunted around as like a symbol to be fetishized is already something that's kind of suspicious amongst like the Jewish crowd themselves. But like even just getting out of that, like it's a bastardization of a Jewish symbol for a like a well, it's not even a Christian holiday. It's a Christian holiday stolen from us pagans, Pagan. like you know. Yeah. So like it's and, and, um, but but it's their cultural like thing. It's like a Christian thing, and Christianity has a history of being like what to Jewish people. Because I'm sure it's not nice. I'm sure it's not inviting. I'm sure it's not, not pleasant. And so Christmas, when you see those was... kind of processes, it's someone imitating. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's a type of assimilation that gets into what you were saying, Red Wasp, where it's not not that assimilation to want to feel fully uh, akin with the not home. Uh, if you look to Herzl's writings all the way, it was always preaching that they were going to take Palestine, they were going to make it theirs, and that they were going to build a new Israel. And uh, that's... That's been like a big centerpiece to all of it. So all of this stuff is about gaslighting people in a way where it gets them cozier with like um, the oppressive nature of Roman Christianity, but then also still uncomfortable enough with it that they would want to flee and like actually like colonize that land. And it's like it's taking advantage of like an extraordinarily extreme trauma in Europe. Um, you know, the Jewish people of Europe have been predominantly like traveler people. So many people could settle down. Like, how could you? Like, you're being terrorized from place to place. Your home gets burned down. You're uh, a massive chunk of your family is massacred in a slaughter because the plague appeared in your village. You know, like terrorization was a constant. And it's why like Jewish peoples are often found in uh, traveler communities, you know, amongst like, like Roma and Irish travelers. Uh, it's a very fucking traumatic experience. And, uh, you know, Herzl capitalized on it really, really well. And his uh, successors did it a million times better than he ever could because he's a fucking rube. Yeah. Oh, my. Well. Sorry, I just come okay. out of fucking accident emergency, so I'm spicy. I've been wronged by the NHS yet again. Ah, yes. Okay, Healthcare. well, we'll take care of that. We just need a revolution, that's all. No problem. <laughs> just. <laughs> and this is Dr. Ibrahim Weisfeld of the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund uh, signing off here, together with everybody else. And thanking you all for your alone. contributions. And uh, this will be up soon. Bye. Okay. Um, Can, may I just say one? Um, yes. Next week... Um, or in a few days, it's one uh, year of uh, the beginning of the Pan Al Aqsa. Um, to all the people who see this, please make some noise. Um, please don't mm. let people forget this, and please uh, try to go against the narrative that this was a terrorist attack that came out of nothing and that uh, this started the whole war. Um, this was an uprising. This was a ghetto uprising. This was uh, very close to what happened in uh, the ghetto of Wilna and the, the ghetto of Warsaw. This. Um, and next week we should really try to break through the, the, yes. the bourgeois narrative about this. And this battle of October the 7th was successful. It wasn't a desperation, an act mm. of uh, suicide. This was a successful yep. military operation which they took out the whole Gaza Brigade. The whole thing fell apart. Yes. Gaza was opened. You mm. know, incredible political significance to that. Okay. And we saw the whole world actually talking about stuff. You know, they tried to censor as much as they could, but social media, Palestinians reporting on stuff, Israel's Israeli soldiers self-reporting <laughs> the genocides they're committing. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you can't say they don't do something right once every a while, letting <laughs> us know that they're horrible people, good on them. Um, yeah. But those pieces of shit, self-reporting, all that, it led to a lot of people seeing how fucking disgusting this fucking yeah. like settler state is and how much it needs to be dismantled. You know, when you go to the protests, you hear people talking about, you know, kicking out the settlers and fucking uh, intifada revolution and from the river to the sea, but like in a way where you know they actually know what it means and aren't just like, because there have been to some protests where it's not been as like, people are still kind of liberal. A lot of people at this protest, I mean, a lot of them are liberals, but a lot of them ain't thinking like liberals. A lot of them are having their minds pushed to more radical senses. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. Okay. 
So, happy new year to everyone. A new year with oh, a new yeah. happy uh, new year. New revolutionary the potential. That's what it is. Yeah. Shantova Tikva Tebu. Okay.